Um, first, um, we're going to hear from Shirish Patel. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Uh, let me put to you an analogy. Uh, I think this is useful because it's a, it's a, a cryptic form of, uh, of uh, communicating uh, a number of ideas. Imagine that we uh, have a national health service, that all of medical practice is privatized, and that the government runs the health service, as it did for many years in the UK. Now imagine that the government decides it doesn't need doctors. After all, the pharmaceutical companies know what drugs are good for what disease. So let the pharmaceutical companies prescribe the medicines for different ailments. And the whole thing can be run uh, by government directly. The parallel <coughs> is that uh, we have no planners in the city anymore. The government has systematically dismantled planning. So in the last 20 years, parallel to a situation where you would have no doctors, we have no planners. We have instead a set of development control regulations emanating from government. You could have a similar set of health control regulations emanating from government, saying if you have this and that symptom, this is the medicine to take. And everything runs very smoothly because the uh, Government regulations prescribe what is to be done in what case, and uh, in uh, the case of uh, planning, the developers decide what's to be done. There's no need for planners anymore. Mr. Mukesh Mehta, by his own uh, admission, is a planner from New York. He knows what's to be done about Dharavi. There's no need for any planning of any kind. There are no detailed plans, and nobody sees the need for them. I heard two numbers this morning. Mr. Kshatriya said that, uh, or earlier this afternoon, sorry, uh, he said there were 70,000 families to be rehoused. And in one of his slides, Mr. Mukesh Mehta showed that the area of Dharavi is 236 <coughs> hectares. So 70,000 families with a family size averaging five is three and a half lakh people. Three and a half lakh people on 2.2 square kilometers is about 150,000 persons per square kilometer. Now, Bhuleshwar Kalbadevi is about 100,000 per square kilometer. It's the densest locality in the world. It's 70% more crowded than its next competitor, which is in Shanghai, uh, which has 55,000. Bhuleshwar has 95,000 or 100,000. And uh, these numbers suggest that we are planning 150,000. That's just the people in Dharavi. In addition, we are expecting to put new construction there, which people will buy, in order to finance the free housing for slum dwellers. I don't see how this can work. Um, now, on uh, one very interesting question that you raised about uh, government acquiring land uh, around the city. Uh, the New Bombay project in 1970, when it was launched, uh, was started with the government acquiring 345 square kilometers of land on the mainland across the harbor. This was all acquired and made government property. What's happening now is that we are selling that land to private owners to establish SEZs. SEZs are zones where they establish economic activities plus housing. So government is actually surrendering the right to develop this land which was acquired, and we are moving from the South American model to the North American model. On the issue you raised of land supply, uh, I think it's being kept deliberately short. There are many things government can do to increase the land supply, and they are not being done. And I think this is a part of uh, an unstated, uh, deliberate policy. Uh, the salt pan lands could be acquired. We're going slow on that. The port trust lands could be uh, part of them, certainly could be reused. That's not being done. 
railways of surplus lands. The Urban Land Sealing Act locks up large tracts of land. The intention originally was that government was, would acquire this land and use it for housing. Government has taken no steps in that direction. And it locks it up so that the owner can't do anything either. It's just locked up. So I think land is being kept deliberately in short supply. And um, as regards this FSI 4, this is my last point, um, you have to s look at FSI in the context of the amount of built up floor space consumed per person. In Mumbai's slum rehousing, it is five square meters per capita. In New York, it is 65 square meters per capita. That is 13 times as much. If you have an FSI of four in Bombay, that corresponds to an FSI of 13 times that, that is 52 in New York. I think even New York would balk at an FSI of 52. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. Um, we next are going to hear from our last um, um, participant, who is uh, P.K. Das, who is with the Slum Dwellers Organization, uh, Navarra Huck. But I also want to acknowledge that you were part of the Bandra Waterfront Center, which is uh, one of the winners of the Urban Age Award for your project um, for opening up the city to the sea, which is a very ambitious and exciting project. So congratulations to you for that. Please. Thank you, Darren. Um, I have probably just about five minutes or less than that, so I just make about, okay, three minutes. So I have five points I thought I'd make in five minutes, but I cut that down. Uh, just a quick summary of uh, key issues that I derive from the various speakers and I relate to from my experiences in Mumbai. Uh, very broadly, two points. One is, I think, these are two aspects that we haven't really dealt with or mentioned much, though the second we have, but the first we haven't. I think in a city like Mumbai, it's the, the, the housing as a real estate agenda is something that we've nearly, really not discussed. We know that the politics of the city, the making of the city has been historically been influenced by the real estate interest. And this is something that we need to really understand in the context, particularly in the context of social housing or mass housing, and how the two are opposite to each other in terms of their fundamental interests. And we have been in this process uh, championing since 1991, which is really a very critical turning point for the city of Mumbai. In fact, for the, uh, for, for the nation, because in 1991, we pledged our support to uh, liberalism to privatization and we pursued uh, since then neoliberal policies and the government put its hands up to say we are not going to develop, we are going to facilitate development, so it backed out but what it means by this and what we see from it happening is that it's actually facilitating private agencies from in, in depleting public assets and, and that's a huge problem right now because if a representative government if a state lacks resources, which it could actually hold for social development programs and mass housing, it's stripped and it's, begged, it's sort of pauperized. The state is pauperized. So therefore, I think it's these two contexts which are extremely important to understand. And we've come to firmly believe as housing activists that the production and supply of affordable housing for the urban poor can only happen through state intervention through active role of the state government or the national government and not through private agencies. We've experienced from 91 to now, which is over 26 years, in spite of the private sector taking over dominant role, we have not supplied any housing stock to the market which is affordable for the urban poor. In fact, the government which through its agencies was producing some amount of housing for the poor has stopped producing. Why are slums proliferating? Because poor do not have access to housing stock in the city. How to produce this housing stock. And in this process, we have some terrible experiences, as speaking from the experience of the slum dwellers and the housing struggles in the city. A, we are slumming our city. We are legitimizing the depletion of public assets. Uh, we, are, we are deliberately marginalizing large sections of the population, frighteningly legitimizing through policies, plans, and programs. 
And this is what is terrible. If you look at the SRA policy, I consider it nothing but a displacement policy. Believe me, it undermines democracy and democratic institutions. In the 70s, we used to take protests of slum dwellers to the secretariat, to the government offices, because they are our elected governments through democratic means. Today, you know what we're fighting who, and with whom are we fighting in our slums and communities are waging struggles? Against private builders, against private corporate companies. That's not democracy. These are the agents. We've completely delinked our communication relationships between the government and the people. And this is frightening to me. And this is perpetuating social violence. This is perpetuating social unrest in the slums. We, instead of grappling with housing solutions, we are grappling with negotiations and peace in the slums. That's how productive time is utilized by, uh, by housing activists and movements. So in short, coming back to the last point I'm making, just the last point about what is the solution. We firmly believe, A, that the state government has to intervene, has to play an active role in promoting, A, B, that the state government has to forge partnership with communities, not partnership with private companies, but with communities, with societies. And in turn, the government and the communities may choose an investor, and the investor could have their benefits through investment into that project as contractors, as et cetera, et cetera. There are many other ways of how capital investments into the housing sector can be benefited through bonds or concessions or tax, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this in a nutshell is the solution that we're looking at. We need to recognize the enormous human resources potential that the slum dwellers possess, the skills in redeveloping their properties. And mind you, if you develop the lands on which slums exist, which is for your information, is just about 8% of the landmass of the city in which over 60% of our people live, you can actually rehabilitate, rehouse, in decent housing, planned housing, which we are all for, we're against slums, we're against slumming, that we can actually accommodate all the slum dwellers extremely well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, Ricky Burdett. No, the, the two issues you end on are very important. One is state, some form of state intervention, second a form of partnership. You're an architect, you won the prize yesterday with a team. You don't mention space. Is it irrelevant? Uh, yes, uh, well, <laughs> it's the detail. One of the it's detail. No, uh, let me explain this. Um, well, one of the things, the weaknesses of the policy, you're, I, I'm happy you brought this point up. You see, the development policy of the state government does not consider social infrastructure provision, including open spaces. It only talks in terms of numbers of houses. And therefore, you saw some of the examples in the morning, I think, in your slide and presentation, Ricky, how housing at Mankhud is stacked together, just 10 feet apart, 10 feet, uh, 10 storied buildings. Now, we have been trying to suggest to the government that where the program has to begin is social infrastructure, because development or underdevelopment is really assessed through social development, including open spaces. And open spaces and slums is a huge resource to community development work. I think that's important. Yeah. Thank you, PK. Why don't we move on to Suresh Sharma? Thank you. Uh, is it on? Don't so, don't oh, don't touch it. it. Okay. Uh, it has been for me a very uh, instructive experience, and I know in the five minutes that I have, uh, I would Three not minutes. be able to do Three. justice to the range and richness of what I heard. Uh, may I uh, therefore begin with some uh, propositions stated as a paradox about the city, city as a, a human form, and uh, inequality. Uh, if I may uh, 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 reverse uh, the phrase uh, of uh, Saskia Sassen about the territorial movement, uh, I, I was struck because the momentariness being associated with territory is a remarkable shift because territory is generally, in human language, the kind of final locus. But it does tell a certain story about the movement of, uh, uh, in modern civilization and modern cognition. So I want to talk about the cognitive moment, uh, the present cognitive moment, in terms of uh, 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 
from which we are looking at the housing for poor. And in that I wish to underscore one, one fact that I think possibly for the first time uh, in the last two, three hundred years, the word change in the context of climate change is used with a degree of acute apprehension. And this is something remarkable because if one looks at utterances, if one looks at discourse in the last 200 years, change is a word valorized in almost all contexts. And the fact that now in the context of climate change, it is used as a kind of a disturbance which has to be coped with, I think has significant implications. Uh, city, it was said by many participants, is an escape, is a movement towards freedom. But this movement towards freedom is increasingly happening in a situation where inequalities are mounting. And this escalation of the proportion of inequality and the genuine quest to escape certain kind of control, certain kind of uh, sensible thing in any Western quarter. Uh, we were repeatedly told that to begin the project of modernization, hard, large, bold decisions needed to be taken and there were other examples who have not fallen out from the pages of history. I say this because I think the pathos which moved the national leadership in India to not only choose democracy but to keep to it under very difficult condition was not perhaps the recreation of a modern world. Not to say that they were anti-modern, but the moving pathos was not to be able to replicate no matter how modernity here at any cost. And this, I think, is important. And this perhaps has something to do vitally by what, Mr. Chairman, you spoke of as this vivid organicity. And the, 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 the capacity to, to, to uh, retain the capacity to nurture this organicity, which manifests, for example, in moments of breakdown when Bombay was flooded and uh, 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 the state was nowhere in evidence, has something to do with the possibility of dignity, dignified inclusion. It may not be absolute equality. I'm not talking about absolute equality. Uh, can I take two Thank more you minutes? very much. Oh. It's very helpful, Suresh. I thought I would say two more minutes. Rahul, please. Okay, sorry. Can you give me one sentence? One, oh. Just one sentence. Of course. One sentence. I'll yield to you for one more sentence. Uh, and this, the sentence is that I think one of our great failings is that we often believe it is closed. enough to say the right thing. And we have often failed to do the right thing, even when we know what is the right thing to do. So the role of the state in India as a regulator, as a custodian of the law, as a force which can see that the different players, including the corporate players, do not transgress the law, has to remain at the very center of things. Oh, please. Uh, <coughs> I'll just you know, I listen to Professor Suresh Sharma was a pleasure. I've you know read some very extremely I would say uh, subtle and insightful books which he's written, and I'm going to actually refer to a very interesting uh, uh, episode in one of um, his uh, stories on a tribal identity in India. This sounds completely out of uh, context over here, but it may not be so. He talks in uh, you know about, about a particular community in um, central India, which were traditional ironsmiths and with with the coming of the railways in the late 19th century, uh, uh, and, uh, these uh, traditional tribal communities which worked with iron simply loved the idea of the railways. They responded very positively. They could understand the idea of modernity very well, translated through the idiom of iron. And of course, uh, the colonial government uh, you know, sort of dismissed this entire experience altogether. And in fact, their own traditional occupation was banned. 
Now, this is, I think, a very, very interesting uh, uh, anecdote, and it's very sort of uh, something which I just thought of right now because I heard Professor Sharma, and it reminds me of what's happening in Dharavi right now, that there is an entire wealth of experience as far as building is concerned, which is already embodied in Dharavi. The residents themselves for the last 40 to 50 years have sharpened the skill, and right now we are just replaying the colonial gaze by simply saying it's not important at all. And it's very easy to use a language of modernity right now and simply evacuate the space um, much in the way we have done you know, in the last 200 years. And I think it's very, very important to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, maybe we could, that's why I was asking uh, Professor Suresh Sharma could really speak for a longer time because I think there are very important, uh, very important uh, I would say, uh, myths hidden in um, what is happening right now in Bombay. And uh, I, uh, for me, there's nothing more to say besides what we already said in the presentation which Matthias made about the idea of form, uh, the idea of the city, uh, the idea of planning. I just wanted to respond to Shirish just by one, saying one more thing that while it is true that the language of planning is something which has been uh, completely taken away uh, from planners, it's also important to know that there's a whole history of the way in which planners have taken away the act of planning from the people themselves. And if there is a certain negotiation which has to be done, it has to be done both ways. The planners have to come in between the people who are also planners, and then, of course, negotiate with the state. That's all. Thank you. I guess coming from the other big democracy, uh, from the other side of the world, I, I, would, I would say that I'm, this, this conversation to me feels um, so relevant and so typical. And what I mean by that is there is this, this undercurrent of what we call colloquially in America hemming and hawing and wringing our hands about <clears throat> government. And that is to say government is just not doing what it's supposed to do. Real estate developers are bad, evil people and they come and just uh, take horrible, horrible pursuit of poor people. Is it that simple? Have we degraded government so much in our two big democracies? Has privatization become the buzzword, the, the de rigueur approach? And have we, in the process, found ourselves in a situation where, where democracy itself has lost control? That the, the, the normative idea behind both uh, I think of the democracy of the United States in India was this notion that government was owned by the people and that through the brilliance of participatory democracy we would perfect this notion that more people would be included, that opportunity would be broader and more equitable. And Today, I think both of our democracies found our, find ourselves challenged by that aspiration. And I think some of the conversation today manifests that challenge. So I don't think it's as simple as saying that government is incompetent and inept and that private developers uh, are simply trying to exploit the poor. I think it's more complicated and far more nuanced than that. But I could be wrong. What?